thanks again for watching this week. Now, I'm sitting on stage in our auditorium, in our sanctuary, right beside our pulpit here where the Word of God is proclaimed every week. It's preached. And we're going to be looking at the very end of our text this week about preaching the Word of God and, and a preacher. So this is Thanksgiving week, and I am very thankful for you guys. So many of you guys uh, watch every week. Some of you drop me a line from time to time, and I really appreciate that. Hey, got an opening question for you. What do you think the, the song um, Hey Jude by the Beatles and It Is Well, what do they have in common? That may be a head scratcher to you, and probably not a lot do they have in common, but these two songs have a great backstory or a story behind the lyrics, why they chose those particular words, uh, the meaning behind those words. Now, it's true, you can enjoy both of those songs without knowing the backstory, but when you understand the meaning of the lyrics and why they chose those particular words, why that was written, then the song means so much more. Well, this week, we're, we're in the last lesson of the unit that's entitled, All In, A Life of Commitment. This is lesson number seven, called Committed to His Mission. The scripture is out of Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 17. And the point of the lesson is that God desires for all people to hear and respond to the gospel. Well, this week we're looking in Paul's letter to the believers in Rome. And the book of Romans is a heavy theological book. In fact, our, our pastor's going through that book right now. It is pretty heavy. And even in our nine verses that we have today, there is a lot of information. But if we understand the backstory of these verses, why Paul chose these particular words, I think we're going to appreciate this familiar passage even more. So if you would, go ahead and open your Bible or your Bible app to Romans chapter 10 so you can follow along as we go through, uh, as we go through our scripture this week. In the previous chapters of Romans, Paul has been making some arguments. He's been arguing that we aren't under the bondage of the law anymore and, the, and that following the law to obtain righteousness just doesn't work because no one can perfectly follow it. And also that just because you're a physical descendant of Abraham, uh, you're not as what we would say in the New Testament, saved. He's also been arguing that God's promise of salvation extends not just, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. So when we get to chapter 9, verse 30, Paul says this, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue uh, a righteousness have obtained a righteousness that is by faith? But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they, the Jews, pursued it not by faith, but as it were, by works. You see, the Jewish thought was that, that they could obtain righteousness by following the law. But Paul said that, that even Gentiles who did not descend from Abraham could obtain righteousness just by their faith. And now we get to our lesson text, all right? We're in Romans chapter 10, 10 verses 9 and 10. If you declare or confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's, and it's with your mouth that you profess or confess your faith and are saved. Now, if you've been involved in any kind of witnessing training program, you're most likely familiar with these two verses and you recognize them immediately. Now, I must admit, I spent a lot of extra time researching these two verses, wondering what part does confession play in salvation? Because you see in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, the Philippian jailer is told to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he would be saved. It doesn't say anything about confession. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, it states that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God or is saved. Nothing about confession. So what part, if any, does confession play in salvation? Well, first of all, it's important to note that the heart and the mouth are tied together. And they're tied together very often in Scripture. In the Old Testament, we can, we can read passages like Psalm chapter 5, verse 9, that says, Not a word from their mouth can be trusted, for their heart is filled with malice. And Psalm 19, 4 states, May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord. 
Proverbs chapter 15, verse 14, contrasts a discerning person from a fool by stating this. The discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. Similarly, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 26, the heart of the righteous weighs his answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Then we get over to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus ties what comes out of the mouth with what is already in the heart. When he says these things, he says, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And then three chapters later, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus says this, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. So the heart and the mouth are connected. And what's in the heart is going to be reflected in one's speech. In other words, our outward actions are a reflection of our inward attitude. But that's not all that the heart of the heart and mouth backstory. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, Moses is he's standing before the Israelites. He's conveying to them God's commands. And he says to them, The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may obey it. But in the verses immediately preceding Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 14, says this. Now, what am I commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to, to, to get it and, and to proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and to proclaim it to us so we may obey it? And then after that's the verse 14, no, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. So why am I dragging this out, you're saying? Well, let's go back to Romans chapter 10 and look in the verses immediately preceding verse 9. Here's what it says. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live, by, will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Just like Deuteronomy. So, so Paul, he's paraphrasing the Old Testament, and he's drawing a parallel between righteousness based on following the law against righteousness uh, based on faith. And, and being that the mouth and, and the heart are so closely connected, when one truly believes and, and puts their faith in Christ, then their outward actions, the, what they say, what they do, is going to reflect their inward commitment to him. So to me, it's not a two-step process for salvation. Not, I always like to put things in math terms. <laughs> so it, it's not belief plus confession equals salvation. To me, it's more like belief equals salvation, which is then evidenced by confession. But that's my take on it. All right, let's go on. We get to verses 11 through 13, and, and here we have some more backstories that are available to us. Verse 11 says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Well, this is a, a quote from Isaiah 28, 16, uh, from the Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. Now, depending on what your translation, your English translation is, uh, you may uh, have some different terms used in Isaiah 28, 16, like will not worry, uh, will not be put in a panic, uh, won't tremble, or, or won't be disappointed, instead of will not be put to shame. But the meaning is the same. If you truly believe that Jesus is the Christ and you put your faith in him, your eternity is settled. You have Nothing to worry about. You won't be put to shame. You don't need to tremble. All those things. 
Then in verse 13, it's a direct quote from Joel chapter 2, verse 32 that says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Paul's making his case in these three verses here that Gentiles are also in God's plan, in his plan of redemption. Everyone, not just those of Jewish descent, who believe, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To me, it's interesting that, that this verse, uh, then verse 11, it says, everyone who believes, and then verse 13 says, everyone who calls. That's kind of like back in verses 9 and 10 about belief and confession. Kind of parallels that, doesn't it? So in a nutshell, verses 9 through 13 are the facts about salvation. It's available to all. Uh, it comes through faith. And now we get to what we are supposed to do with these facts. In other words, what's our mission? That's the title of our lesson, is being on mission with God. So again, Romans 10, 14 through 17 is probably a familiar passage if you've been in the church world for some time. Verses 11 and 13 tell us that salvation is available to all who call on God, but we're presented with a problem starting in verse 14. How can a person call on someone to save them if they haven't believed that he can save them? And how can a person believe in someone that they've never heard of? That leads to another question. How can a person hear about this Savior unless another person comes and tells them? And then the teller or the preacher has to be sent to convey that gospel message. Well, being sent, the proclaimer, preaching, hearing, believing, and calling, these are all vital links in the chain that lead to salvation. You can think of your own relationship with Christ and how if one person had been disobedient in your, in your spiritual lineage, how you may not now be a believer. And the preacher, or the one who brings the good news, is blessed for carrying out the task. You know, the, the, the beautiful feet in verse 15 is, is a quote from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. But it's not all roses and easy going for the, for the one who's proclaiming, for the preacher. No, there, there's also the warning that not all who hear are going to obey the gospel. You know, it was true with Israel in the Old Testament times, and it's true today. Not everyone who hears believes. But as the old saying goes, we're just called to plant the seed. Now, verse 17 is a summary statement for Paul. He says that faith can only come through hearing the gospel. Literally, what does gospel mean? Good news. From hearing the good news. And the message that must be heard and acted by faith upon is the word of or the word about Christ. So God invites us to be on mission with him wherever we are. We don't have to be a full-time missionary, giving up everything, going across the sea. We don't have to do that. We don't have to be on staff at a church. We don't even have to be a Sunday school teacher. We're just called to be salt and light wherever we are, at work, at home, even at Walmart. So who, who will you represent Jesus to this week, both by how you act and by what you say? Well, next week we start a new quarter and a new unit of study. We're going to be in the Psalms for six straight weeks. We're going to be looking at when emotions rise. I know at Christmas time we might get a little emotional. Got all the family over. We're going to be looking at grief, fear, anger, worry, the blues. So that's all I have for you this week. So thank you so much for watching or listening if you're on SoundCloud. So again, don't forget to pray for your class. I hope you have both a, a great Thanksgiving and a great Sunday school class this week. Thanks again.